started. Lunch will be available. They were caught in traffic, so we haven't forgotten you, but it will be available uh, upon completion of, the, uh, of our seminar. So I just want to I want to welcome everybody and thank everybody for coming out. This is the first of our uh, public health and medicine seminar series. And I just want to acknowledge a few people that really really helped make this happen. Dean Marla Gold, who was really uh, instrumental in making this happen. Dean Homan for his support. Dr. Hamilton in the Department of Emergency Medicine. Dr. Rich in the Department of Health Management and Policy faculty and staff of the Center for Nonviolence and Social Justice, and special thanks to Beverly Haas, who actually made all of this um, come together. And I also want to thank you for attending and recognizing the importance of public health and medicine. The series is going to be held quarterly. The next one is going to be scheduled for Wednesday, January 12th, to reemphasize the importance of collaboration and affiliation between and with public health and medicine. And we know, we know that public health is multidisciplinary and serves to protect and improve the health of communities. It's proactive, preventive, and in its approach. And the community is its patient. We also know that medicine is also multidisciplinary and serves to treat disease and promote health. Did I move your slide? <laughs> So approaching public health and medicine allows healing of an individual as well as a community, promoting health and humanity for a person as well as a society. Hence, the seminar will work to keep your finger on the pulse of our communities as health care providers, public health practitioners, and researchers. So hence, our speaker, Dr. Cheryl Haran. Cheryl's an associate professor and associate residency director in the Department of Emergency Medicine and assistant dean for medical education and student affairs on the Grady campus of Emory University. She's board certified in emergency medicine and was appointed by the governor in 2002 to the Georgia, Community Commission, Georgia Commission on Family Violence. She's board member for, women's resource, for the Women's Resource Center to End Domestic Violence a member of Domestic Violence Task Force in DeKalb County, the National Center for Injury Control Advisory Committee, and the Public Health Committee of the American College of Emergency Physicians. She's worked with the Institute of Medicine on a report on educating health professionals on family violence. She's the immediate past chair of the Emergency Medicine Section of the National Medical Association. She's received a 2003 Partnership Against Domestic Violence HOPE Award the 2005 Women in Medicine Award from the Council of Concerned Women of the National Medical Association, the 2006 Gender Award from the Commission on Family Violence, and in 2008 named a Hero of Emergency Medicine by ASAP. Dr. Haran has lectured extensively on the med medical response to intimate partner violence as well as on diversity in emergency medicine. I also have to add that Cheryl is a, it has been a mentor to me I mean, I'm dating her a little bit, but actually, she she looks amazing. So, <laughs> so, uh, so ten years ago, a little over ten years ago, I interviewed for residency there, and I also interviewed for a position there. Probably three years after that, but she's always been instrumental and supportive and and encouraging in the work that I'm doing. So, I want I also have to acknowledge my emergency medicine residents, who are pretty amazing, and uh, I just want to. Give a warm welcome to Dr. Haran. So, so good afternoon. Let me start there. And let me say that it's not my usual style to stand behind a podium. It seems a bit constricting and confining. But I do want to thank Ted for inviting me to come and speak with you in what I hope will be an interesting conversation around public health and emergency medicine. Um, as he stated, I've been doing this work uh, for quite some time, and when he asked me to come, I was really struggling with exactly what I would say, because when you think about the profession of medicine, emergency medicine, it's vast, it's large, there's, there's lots of literature around that, and certainly in the field of public health, uh, the same could be applied. So I want to thank you for hearing and listening, and most of all, I hope, taking something with you as you do your day-to-day -day practice, whether it's in the emergency department, in the clinics, in the community centers, or whatever you do. So here's my disclosure statement. I have uh, nothing to gain financially or otherwise uh, from this conversation. 
And I just want you to take a pause and stop and think about what public health means as it relates to, in my estimation, emergency medicine, because that's the world in which I live. Think a little bit about your role. Um, certainly, when you see patients in the emergency department or in the clinic, that's quite frankly the easy thing to do. We are quite capable of teaching you how to take care of lacerations, how to take care of penetrating trauma, how to take care of blunt trauma. But I'm, I'm really challenging you to think beyond that and broader than that. And then think about it as it relates to research. Not everyone is going to be a bench scientist. Not everyone is going to be engaged necessarily in research, but everyone can certainly support the work around research that our colleagues do day to day in your own setting and certainly you know, abroad and nationally. And so when I was thinking about how to make this at least relevant to some, if not all of you, I decided to do a case-based approach. A uh, case-based approach tends to work well. It tends to engage you. And in this particular case, the case is going to be me uh, because it's the easiest person to talk about in terms of what I've done to date and how something of what I may say may strike a chord in what you're doing each day. And so these are some of the things that I am engaging in now. And I'll just walk you through a little bit of each of them one by one. And each of you can certainly insert yourself into either one of them. So where are my emergency medicine residents, just so I know? So the middle row, right? So that's you, right? You're an emergency medicine practitioner like me. I work uh, at Grady Hospital, which is a level one trauma center in Atlanta. It's huge. It's big. It's the only level one trauma center in the city of Atlanta. And I'm employed by Emory University School of Medicine. Um, in that capacity, we see patients. I know that you all see patients, my emergency medicine colleagues, they come in, they come in fast, they come in furious, they come in with lots of needs. This is our trauma bay in Atlanta where we have to act very quickly and we have to act in a hurry. And so I know that you are capable or at least becoming quite facile at caring for patients as they enter into your doors. But I would ask, you know, what is your role? You, you've self-identified as physicians, that's fine, and you deliver care, that's fantastic. But, you know, do you teach? And as you should be teaching medical students, your colleagues, your residents, your nurses, your staff, your patients, your community, anyone that you come in contact with, and are you advocating for public health issues? Because you should, and if you don't think you are, you are. Whether it may be intuitive or obvious or not, I would dare say that every patient that you see is an opportunity to talk with them about what impacts their lives, how their lives are impacted, and how you can help engage them, not only individually as a patient you have before you, but also in the community in which they reside. All our patients belong to several communities, whether it's their community of origin, i.e. their families, whether it's a community in which they live, i.e. their neighborhoods, whether it's a community they worship in, whether it's a community they work in. So that is something that in terms of facilitating, and I like you know, Ted's idea of bringing uh, public health and emergency medicine together in a collaborative fashion, that's a way that we can start to think broadly beyond just the patient care encounter. And that leads into screening, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, as well as supporting research, as I mentioned before. So as a healthcare practitioner, as an emergency medicine physician, maybe some of you will aspire and go on to be an associate residency director or an assistant dean. Whatever that may look like, the point is that when they come into our doors, this is what it may look like. And this is what I teach our students and our residents to think about, not only the ED as a safety net, but for the patients that come in, but for all of the people that we encounter. We encounter many people who are disenfranchised. They're homeless. They have no place to go. We are where the buck stops. We are the ones that will help them attain or retain their health. We think about whether they come from our colleagues who have a need for a higher level of service. Not only is Grady a level one trauma center, but it's also uh, well known for its burn unit, its sickle cell care, for its poison control center, for neonatal care. We get referrals, not just at Grady, but at Emory, where we have a tertiary or quaternary response for patients who are quite complicated, such as our transplant patients. And we receive and we'll have individuals from EMS and private practice and life flight, because we get patients from all over Georgia who will land in our emergency department and will need us. And so I would argue that we, i.e. the people in the emergency department, whether you're a teacher, an educator, or a practitioner, are the ones that will keep our patients and our populations healthy. 
The IOM has been quite you know, good at keeping us aware and abreast of what this means in terms of medicine and public health. And if you don't consider yourself, again, a public health practitioner, maybe you should, because a public health professional is a person who is educated in public health, and you are educated every day you work in the ED around issues that impact our patients, and or related to a discipline who is employed to improve health, whether it's our nursing staff, our social work staff, our chaplaincy staff, with a focus on the population. And so not only should we work together as public health professionals with our medical colleagues, but I dare say nursing, social work, chaplain, and the like are all in the game and all in the mix. But it's not an easy thing if you think about where we're moving towards the challenges and looking at the challenges of the 21st century. We have climate change, global warming, as you know, globalization where, where we are having more and more people shrinking or coming closer in proximity to each other. The population is growing. I'm dare saying that as we age and as our baby boomers continue to age, we will have a plethora of individuals over the age of 65 in the very near future. Are we equipped and are we ready to care for them? Do we have the training necessary to be able to do that? And when we look at the demographic and the shifts in demographic where we will have the majority of our country by 2050 being underrepresented minorities, are we ready to do that? And looking at the advances in science and medical technology, is it one place versus the other or is it widespread? If we have electronic medical records, how is it going to impact places that might not have that? And what will be our role in addressing those challenges? You continue to see every day, we see it in the news, growing economic and healthcare disparities. We see unemployment rates up. We see jobless rates going up. We see emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases, such as the resurgence of HIV and the growth of HIV nationally, dengue fever, when you look in the south, in the um, southern uh, countries. And then you see our unhealthy eating habits that evolves into obesity, which is a, of national concern to us. And we think about water and food security in the sense of bioterrorism and how that might, we might be infected, impacted. And what role will we play as public health professionals to address it? So prior to my um, position now as an associate residency director and as assistant dean, I actually came to Emory in 1996. And I did a fellowship in injury control and prevention. And the purpose of that was to ask the question that all my, were my public health Students, I think there's some around, okay. The who, what, when, where, why of what's happening in particular area of interest for me, which is intimate partner violence or family violence. I was already uh, a resident in terms of completing my residency training program, so I was moving on to the next phase of my life. And it is very easy, as I said, to take care of injuries, but I couldn't quite understand why things were happening. Why were injuries happening? Why? aren't perpetrators held accountable? Why aren't we responding to our patients in a way that could keep them safe and that can keep them you know, away from the fear of being re-victimized? And in that fellowship, I actually was housed in the School of Public Health. Admittedly, I had my Master's of Public Health prior to going to medical school, so I had a macro view of the world, which helped inform my micro view of the world in terms of patient care. But I can say that doing the fellowship really helped me gain an appreciation of the work we do in the emergency department. And when I took care of patients who had injuries that were preventable, quite frankly, whether it's falls or um, unintentional injuries such as falls or intentional injuries such as suicide attempts or family violence or intimate partner violence, that really did help inform my ability to care for patients going forward. And when I talk with residents and students about Partner violence, for example, I get the glazed look. Do we have to ask about it? We don't know what to do about it. And they do know what to do about it because they are professionals. And we will teach them what to do about it, not to become experts necessarily, but certainly to be able to offer resources and offer comfort to the patients that we care for. And so with public health physicians, we perform core tasks. I would say that as our patients come in and you look at systems-based practice and utilization of resources, if we do prevention and ask the questions prior uh, to injuries worsening or perhaps going to lethality, i.e. homicide, we would be doing good not only for our patients but for our systems. 
we can provide the leadership necessary to promote and support public health systems. And I would say to you, if you don't have social services and chaplaincy services and different services in your departments, it's something to think about as a group of people in the coordinated community response you will need to help care for your patients. Because no matter what we do, I tell people, if we respond to injury and violence, we will still have lots of work in the emergency department. It's not as if taking away or preventing or mitigating against violence will leave us without work, without doing things that are necessary. It will help us actually to do our work better, and it will help us to care for the patients and the public that we serve. And so the IOM 10 years ago actually talked about this. This is nothing new. This is a conversation that's recurring, but as we move towards healthcare reform, a conversation that will frankly be elevated as we think about you know, how do our patients present and what are the causes? 70% of causes of death in the United States are due to behavioral and environmental factors. And if you don't believe that, just think about the patients you have seen and some of the challenges that they face. Yet less than 5% of our annual spending on health care in the U.S. is directed towards preventable conditions. And quite frankly, it's because that doesn't pay. Right? We get paid for procedures, we get paid for high technological advances. Sometimes, as we know, there is waste uh, uh, afforded with that, which we should rethink how we're doing, and the Health Care Act, I'm sure, will respond to that. And it's simply not just the patient. The patients have different things they bring to the occasion, whether it's their genetic income, their housing or substandard housing in which they live, the economic inequality which they face, access to clean water and air, their educational status, environmental toxins that we're all exposed to, our behavioral things that can be modified. So do you tell your asthmatics, for example, that they should stop smoking? And do you tell them every day? And even if you tell them every day and you say, I saw them last week and told them last week, you tell them again this week until it might be the day that they may hear you and you work with them in what we call the therapeutic alliance to enable them to see that they can live productive and healthy lives. I am not sitting here and suggesting when I talk to my patients who come in with cocaine-related chest pain that it's something easy to do. I'm sure you don't see that in Philadelphia. But in Atlanta, when we see cocaine-related chest pain, it is always, we need to just tell them to stop doing cocaine. Well, you know what, how about the patient tells you, doc, I just like doing cocaine. It feels good. I like the way it makes me feel. And we say, okay, given that reality, let's talk about how we can acknowledge that as opposed to thinking we can blame the patient and saying just stop doing that, which quite frankly it's an addiction, and get them to see and get them to therapeutically align with us to get them to think about their behavior modification. And of course the discrimination with uh, patients who are coming across the border, patients that we're trying to care for uh, with, uh, who are here and how we do that. So the links are interesting, and if you think about it and you self-reflect and ask yourself the questions, emergency medicine or medical uh, uh, professionals and public health professionals have the same concern, or at least we should. We should have a common concern for the population that we serve, because one individual patient that you serve, again, resides in a population that is inherent to many, many different systems. We both share the consequences when public health fails. You see it every day. When patients can't get access to services because of socioeconomic status or various things that impact that, they come to the emergency department and we care for them to the best of our ability. We're the first ones to spot events of public health importance. My first night shift in Atlanta was Centennial Park bombing. They were gonna send me back, but I stayed and it's 14 years later, but I was right there on the front line was something of national importance and quite frankly public health importance because at the time it was unsure if it was an act of terrorism, ended up in the emergency department at Grady and we had to care for that and respond to that in a way that would keep everyone safe and, and, and feeling that they were not in harm's way. We work with vulnerable populations and patients. Emergency medicine does that, public health practitioners do that as well. How do we come together to address that in totality in the work that we do? And how do we balance the interests of many against the needs of one? Both realms do that. And there are many people who do that. And there are public health agencies and infrastructures to help us, the communities, the clinicians, you, those of you in the room, healthcare and uh, public health professionals who are in the room, our employers who we work for, academia, which is important for us to talk about and educate ourselves and grow and develop 
in this arena, the media, whether they are friends or not. I have some problems with the media, for example, and how we report family violence. We're not doing very well in Georgia. I don't know how you're doing here in um, Pennsylvania, but we're not doing very well in Georgia around the issue of partner violence. We're 13th in the nation in terms of homicide of men killing women, and part of the problem is our media does not identify it for what it is. Man found dead after killing his wife news at 11. No conversation, no discussion about partner violence and the resources that they could provide for someone who was listening who might be able to get some help at that time. And how do we in involve our patients and family? Because we're not abdicating or suggesting that patients should not be engaged. In fact, they need to be a central part of the conversation and need to be empowered to know that they can take ownership and help us determine the best route of action to help them attain or retain their health. And so I cast before anybody know who these people are? Gentlemen on the left? We're my public health people. Lady on the right? All right, I'm glad we're having this talk. That's good. <laughs> Gentleman on the left is George Benjamin. He is the executive director for the American Public Health Association. The lady on the right is Linda DeGruder. She's a former pres uh, president of APHA, but now is currently the director of the National Center for Injury Prevention and Control. I put that up there to remind us that we can weave uh, public health and emergency medicine in different things that are already occurring, whether it's immunization programs that are out there, SBIRT programs that are out there, STD, HIV, AIDS, screening in the emergency department, intimate partner violence, screening and referral, fall preventions and preparedness. And specifically in our own shop down at uh, Emory in, at Grady, we are looking at the SBIRT model, which is screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment for individuals who are not necessarily um, um, addicted to alcohol yet, but have high risk factors that could probably be addressed, i.e. referred to, to help think about how that would work. And we have a $20 million trial uh, going on with NIH to look at uh, progesterone as a protective factor through Dave Wright uh, four hours after blunt traumatic brain injury. So research is paramount to help us do what we do, and these are some examples of what we're doing at Emory. One of the things we're also doing is looking at the Safety and NIA project. Safety and NIA stands for the, the research addressing intimate partner violence in African American women. We actually are collaborating with the Department of Psychiatry and Psychology, again, in a mutual effort for patients who will come to us in the emergency department who are either um, there because they attempted suicide by ingestion or they've actually uh, caused harm uh, to themselves by any other means or if they have been battered by their partners. We have a direct link where we can call what we call the NEO project to have them come down time zero to not only enroll them in the, in the study to see what interventions may work but also to provide time zero resources to assist and we are doing HIV screening in the emergency department with the hopes of getting our patients seen and evaluated sooner rather than later if they are screened positive. In terms of my work in emergency medicine, I am a member of the ASA Public Health Committee, of which Ted is also a member. We are looking at specifically this year uh, finding those areas of interest that look at disparities. Uh, in healthcare as it relates to uh, populations of color. And we actually published a paper several years ago in the Emergency Medicine Clinics of North America that looked at the public health approach as to how this may look. As a past chair of the NMA Emergency Medicine section and as a member of the Board of Scientific Counselors of the NCIPC, going back to George's Benjamin and Linda DeGudis, that's where the link is. George Benjamin not only is the executive director of APHA, but he also was a founding member of the National Medical Association's Emergency Medicine Section, of which we have a research forum named after him. So the link is there even from back then. It continues now. He has a legacy with us as someone who chaired that section. It is a way in which we can encourage and engage research for our students and residents. And I'm going to make a plug that if you all are interested in coming to the NMA, it will be next year in Washington, D.C., where we look at issues of disparities in health care. And the NCIPC, Linda DeGudis, just took over, as I stated, as the executive director. And here's the mission of the NMA for those who don't know. And at the NCIPC, their research agenda prioritized, uh, considers preventing child maltreatment, motor, vo motor vehicle collisions, and falls among the older adults. Why is that important? Well, as you're in your 
uh, settings of medicine, whether it's the emergency department or medicine, you should think about how you are addressing these issues. Are you seeing patients who are uh, victims of child maltreatment and how are we engaging the resources we have around us to be able to mitigate against it or at least decrease that? How are we uh, thinking about preventing motor vehicle collisions as patients come into our ED? Every patient that leaves us, we tell them, remember to wear your seatbelt. If you didn't have one on, do you wear helmets? Are you buckling up? Do you have the appropriate uh, car seats in your car? Falls among the older patients. We think about what the home health situation looks like. We engage our social workers to help us with that, particularly for patients who may be going back home and don't have the necessary resources to make that work. And, you know, finally, I got the slide from my mentor and colleague, um, Art Kellerman, you know, that's a big advocate. He's arguably probably one of the most well-known physicians in emergency medicine and thinking about this link of emergency medicine and public health. And he said, you know, Cheryl, this is perfect when you think about advocacy. Medicine is a social science and politics, nothing but medicine on a grand scale. And I actually like this one a little bit better that says, what after all has maintained the human race on this old globe, despite all the calamities of nature and all the tragic failings of mankind, if not the faith in new possibilities and the courage to advocate them. And it doesn't mean that you have to, you know, be particularly, you know, outwardly prolific and knowing all of it, but you can speak up and you can have a voice and you can advocate. And I do that through my work as a commissioner on the Georgia Commission on Family Violence, and which as you heard, you know, I was elected by then uh, Governor Barnes, who's rerunning, by the way. It's interesting how we do that in Georgia, but he's running again for governor. Um, to, and we got together to develop a comprehensive state plan for ending family violence. And what we ended up doing through that effort is crafting a medical protocol that has been revised uh, to assist physicians who are thinking about uh, responding to and engaging around issues of family violence. And we have meetings and we go to the legislature every year to speak with our legislators about issues that impact and affect our patients as well as our specialty. This was last year's legislative day where we got together to think about healthcare reform coming down the pike. We bring our residents with us. It's, it's a conference day embedded in there. And we teach them about advocacy. We teach them about the import of the work that they do at the bedside of their patients. And not only can they impact the patient time zero, but on a macro level, because many of our patients just frankly don't have the voice to be able to speak up and speak out about things that are impacting them. One year when I went down there, we had a bill called pink lining, where insurance companies were utilizing or using domestic violence as a precondition uh, uh, to getting insurance. And we had, which is absurd, I know, but we actually had to go down and lobby against uh, this pink lining bill and actually won that battle. And the power of the white coat, I have to tell you, is, is enormous and extraordinary, and you should feel you know, very good about the opportunity uh, to do that. This year we're fighting, uh, and that's our legislative day there up on the right with some of our residents involved about a trauma system um, in Georgia that we frankly don't have. Uh, we don't have a comprehensive statewide trauma system. Do you all have one here in Pennsylvania? So great, good for you. We don't. See, Georgia's got some problems. We're still working, working on Georgia. But we don't have a comprehensive statewide trauma system. And one of the big things we're working on through advocacy is thinking about how we're going to convince our legislators that it's important. If you think about the state of Georgia, the size of Georgia, and the fact that we have four level one trauma centers, it's an abomination. And not only is it an abomination because the patients can't get to a trauma center involved, you know, if they're involved in a collision, but if we have, for example, big, 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 big events that happen in Georgia such as Gay Pride uh, Weekend we had last weekend. We have uh, national um, um, sporting events that happen. And quite frankly, if you don't have a trauma center or a city that can respond appropriately, guess where the patients will come? To the emergency department to see us, where there's one, that would be Grady, where you would be involved and you would be caring for the patients. And so it's extremely important that we get out there and make it work. From a public health standpoint, this is what it means. Without a trauma system, um, we we'd still maintain or still have um, the rate of death as you see before you. We are worse than the national average and the number of lives saved on a public health from a statewide uh, level would be 712 lives per year. What does that mean? Well, the bottom line is the most important line which is to vote. 
we get our residents and our students and everyone that we can educate and engage, including the community, to go out there and talk with their legislators on election day on November 2nd to vote on ensuring that we get a trauma system that would integrate a state EMS system and establish resources and authorize funds so that patients could be cared for, not only on the micro level, but on the macro level when you consider how we're impacted um, on the appropriate level. So public health really is what we do, what we do collectively to ensure uh, the conditions for people to be healthy. Again, nothing new, it's been on the Institute of Medicine's radar since 1988. And finally, as the Associate Director for the Emergency Emory Center for Injury Control, I can tell you that that is our latest and greatest and most engaging thing that we're doing now in that under the leadership of Deb Howery, who's also an emergency medicine physician with a public health degree, we got a $5 million grant from CDC to establish a multi-institute research center. And our goal is to build the future of injury prevention, reduce injuries in Georgia, facilitating collaboration so we have schools in the, in the spirit of collaboration that includes Morehouse, that includes Georgia State, Georgia Tech, Spelman, and the like. And we provide funding for them to do research again connecting uh, science uh, to practice to be able to speak the language and give us evidence to do our work and do it well. We're also creating training uh, programs to help with our practitioners and researchers, and we're really striving to build bridges between science and practice. And I'm not sure if this works or not, but if it does, I'll just give one public service announcement about the center, because what we have done over the last year has just been phenomenal in that we created this website, so in the spirit of collaboration and the spirit of sharing knowledge and information, anyone and everyone is welcome uh, to go to our website to see what we're doing, how we're doing it. Uh, we not only take education and training, but look at research and, and put out, um, we just put out our first journal uh, with the Western Journal of Emergency Medicine with the research that has happened uh, within our center. We do brown bag sessions um, through education and training, and we have calendars of events that, again, bring practitioners of all sorts and all walks together to do the work. And it's something that we're hoping will not only inform and impact the state of Georgia, but certainly on a regionally and perhaps on a, on a national uh, level as well. That's our team. Uh, Deb Howery is there in the middle. Again, uh, we have uh, members from across universities and between the universities. And our research, to, again, to build research uh, to practice is one, for example, I just put up a couple, is our kiosk translation study, where taking the burden away from physicians who would have to necessarily screen, because that is a concern that we get. We don't have enough time. We don't have enough resources. We actually have a computer that patients could self-disclose um, self and feel comfortable going to. The limitation, obviously, they have to be able to be ambulatory, because this is done in the waiting room, so it does negate ambulance traffic. But patients are screened on behavioral uh, issues such as their drinking and or their substance abuse, um, their violence history, and are given resources time zero um, by our researchers who are there in the emergency department. Another ECIC research study is looking at acute care early intervention in the emergency department. So again, for patients that you may have seen who may have been victims of violence, which I know Ted's program uh, looks a lot at youth violence, uh, would be given information or an intervention to prevent PTSD after trauma. And that's a work in progress, and again, hoping that research will inform practice. So the question is, is there a role for us? More importantly, is there a role for you? I'm pretty clear about my role, and I'm pretty clear that you have roles that can be engaged and, and to think outside the box to get involved. And absolutely, whether it's in advocacy, whether it's in prevention research, whether it's in clinical bedside engagement and involvement uh, with your patients, whether it's in community uh, boards, you can pick one, two, all three. You can do anything. The point is you can do something. And the real question is how is that going to look in the face of health care reform with the Affordable Care Act already underway, which promises to give us quality, affordable health care. It promises to improve the role of public programs such as Medicare and Medicaid. It promises to improve quality and efficiency. And I highlighted here, it promises to improve public health. 
So we should all be thinking in the future about what we're doing and how we're doing it and how that will be impacted by the Affordable Care Act and quite frankly, what will our health care workforce look like? Will we have the necessary uh, number of physicians uh, trained, ready, and equipped to be able to respond to the needs of the public in the way that is necessary? So what is your role? Think about my, my uh, residents there, connecting the micro to the macro connecting with your colleagues in the School of Public Health, connecting with your colleagues in the School of Social Work, connecting with your colleagues in the schools of biomedical sciences in a collaborative effort that would make sense because this isn't really rocket science, you just have to want to do it. Each one of us can certainly make a difference and I just ask and submit that if you consider the possibilities, you know, looking at the case Exhibit A, um, I think that it would be a great thing. And watching the news this morning, what I'm most struck by always is our ability as human beings and people to collectively make a difference. As we saw the miners being merged uh, out of Chile uh, today, it's yet another reminder that we can all work hard, work strong, work fast, and work efficiently to make it work. So in connecting science to practice, I leave you with those thoughts. I know this is an inaugural uh, conversation and I'm hoping that this will spur further conversations and thoughts going forward about how the School of Public Health, the School of Medicine, the schools and the clinics and your partners in the work can get together uh, to improve the health of not only our patients but our public. And with that, I will stop and take questions. Thank you, Cheryl. If you guys have any questions, I'm just going to ask that you step to the mic and ask. Um, we have a few moments for, for questions. I'm Don't. between them and the food. Oh, oh, yeah. I know that we're between the, the food and everything, but. Uh, and I think we're, we're, I wanted to acknowledge that Queen Lane and, and Corman are our video conferencing in. So if you guys have any questions, please feel free to ask as well. So thank you very much, Dr. Haran. It's a really, um, a really cutting edge presentation about how we bring these together. And you ended by talking about the Affordable Care Act and health care reform. And I wonder if you might take a moment to speculate about, um, given that emergency rooms are, and departments are often providing primary care that overwhelms the opportunities to do some of the other more focused work, what you think the impact of the CARE Act might be, or how, what do you envision that they might be um, on the issue of how emergency departments are able to do this other work? So, so the question really is focused on the last slide which talked about the Affordable Care Act and the role of emergency medicine physicians and the impact on the emergency department. I can tell you that I, I speculate um, first on the first blush because we're not quite ready um, nor quite equipped to be able to respond that we're going to have a surge um, of patients who will come into the emergency department because they quite frankly will not have the access to primary care physicians that they would otherwise need. And I think what that would, that would absolutely need to require is a conversation and dialogue with our primary care health partners in medicine to not run or shy away from, which I'm sure none of you have problems with getting your consultants to take patients and um, just embrace them into your practice. But that being said, there's going to have to be a, a paradigm shift around what that would look like and ownership around patients who, quite frankly, don't need emergent care because the emergency room has I think lost that real focus of what it's supposed to be about. And I think it, as we look at it now, I don't have the numbers, the proliferation of urgent cares is certainly going to be a, a way in which I think uh, people will be going. We're already seeing that now. Um, I think that it's also going to help us think strategically about true education of our patients in the emergency department to as to what they can do for themselves, i.e. minor injuries. Have you really tried something before coming to the ED, such as analgesia, uh, that could have impacted your care. And I think, quite frankly, the dialogue is going to, going back to my remarks on advocacy, require us to be at the table in those conversations. Because if we're not there, uh, things will just continue to evolve and happen in a way that's going to 
be out of control, and there's going to be an egress. They already predict a shortage of physicians coming up in the future, hence the growth of medical school classes by 10 percent, admittedly not really married and buffeted with the growth of GME slots, which is going to be a problem, I predict, coming down the road, and something we'll need to focus on and, and, and think about. So I hope that answers you a little bit. Anybody else? Anything? So I just want to, I hope this opens your mind to really focus on how, how public health and medicine really are, are, are married together and one doesn't function without the other. And so my efforts, our efforts, are really going to be to demonstrate the importance of that collaboration. So with that, uh, Dr. Ramoska, I guess you have a question? No, I don't have a question. I just want to also thank you, Ted, for uh, setting this whole thing up. Ted has been the um, sort of the engine behind this collaboration between the de uh, Department of Emergency Medicine and Public Health. And so thank you for doing this. And just you might want to remind everybody that we're going to try to do this on a quarterly basis, I believe. Yes. I think the next one we had talked about was doing in January. January 12th. Same so, time. Um, Lunch will be ahead of time this time. <laughs> we'll, we'll work out the kinks by next time, but we'll make sure we get the things moving in the forward direction. But thank you again, Ted, for setting all this up. And, and thank you all again. And no, thank you all for y'all stayed awake. My litmus test, if, if I can get you to lunch and no one's sleeping, I'm good. So, <laughs> so I'm good. So again, thank let's you. thank Cheryl, Dr. Haran. <laughs> A reminder for everybody who's interested in CME, just make sure you sign in. All the students and the residents and house staff please sign, and faculty, please sign in also. And then lunch is on your way out, so enjoy. And thank you and have a great afternoon. <laughs>